Was last month's Fedwire break a coincidence? Jeff Snyder, head of global research for Alhambra Partners, helped me understand what is this article about March 26th, 2021, Alhambra Investments. What are we talking about? We're talking about the Battle of Dunkirk during World War II. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> well, I think it, I don't know how those two things tie together. Well, I think it's it, Jay Powell decided he was going to give an interview earlier this week on a national public radio and decided that, you know, it, a retrospective of what had happened last year in March of 2020, and the Fed acted heroically and saved the system from, from itself, from its own worst, worst designs. And then without the Federal Reserve, sort of like the Battle of Dunkirk, where the British nation got in all their, their you know, these little tiny yachts and boats and rescued the British Expeditionary Force or what was left of it from the beaches of Dunkirk, saving the British Army for a later fight against Nazi fascism. And so Jay's analogy was the Federal Reserve was something similar. The world was going completely wrong and awry. And they, thank God Jay Powell was there to rescue the system before it completely collapsed into whatever singularity he has in mind for what, what, what happens without quantitative easing. Well, let me read to you how Mr. Powell was introduced on National Public Radio by Steve Inskeep. Here it is. Jerome Powell is on the line. He is the chair of the Federal Reserve Board charged with helping to manage the world's largest economy. One year ago, the Fed was effectively printing enormous amounts of money, unprecedented amounts, creating trillions of dollars to help avoid economic collapse in the early stages of the pandemic. Did the Federal, chair, the Federal Reserve Chair correct Mr. Inskeep? Yeah, there's that lie again, right? Flooding the world, what, what lie? money us. pouring into the real economy. It's, it's, it's the same thing that's been, the same lie that's been repeated in the media since quantitative easing began 20 years ago. And Jay Powell knows it's not true, but yet he didn't, he didn't you know, I mean, he went on 60 Minutes in May of last year and basically said the thing, the, outright stated it for himself. They flooded the world with digital dollars, which just isn't true. And he knows it's not true, but he needs everybody else to believe it's true because that's what quantitative easing really is. It's about signaling and expectations and things like that. And that's why he came on and talked about Dunkirk was because Powell was trying to say, after we flooded the world, we, that's how we sit, that's the boats, that was the rescue. You know, it, it's, if we hadn't flooded the world with dollars, it, the world would, it would have been a much, much worse fate. Here's what Mr. Powell said. And we knew that in hindsight, we would, there would be learning that we would get that we could, no, I'm reading, what is happening here? And we knew that in hindsight, we would, there would be learning that we would get that we could do things better. But I think that strategy, I liken it to Dunkirk, you know, when it was time to get in the boats and get the people, not to check the inspection records and things like that. Just get in the boats and go. And that's what we did. I think overall it was a very successful program. And I think history will treat it well. Maybe not even history. Let's not wait for history. Why don't we give the Federal Reserve the Central Bank of the Year Award? <laughs> yeah, Central Banking Magazine did that already. And I think, you know, look, the Dunkirk rescue was a historic success, but only because the Battle of Dunkirk was a historic failure. And so Jay Powell bringing up Dunkirk is actually a, a, a fitting analogy, but not for the reasons he actually believes. Jay wasn't part of the boats and you know the private British citizen rescuing the operation. Jay was a British general on the land losing the battle to begin with. I had a, 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 re, a reader email me a, actually the perfect summation of Jay's of Jay's uh, content that he was at you know that the Fed's operation was Dunkirk. You know, I totally agree, Jay. Just like Dunkirk, you didn't see it coming. You got your ass handed to you, and you're lucky, you're lucky it didn't turn out worse. That absolutely describes the British leadership, the British and French leadership at the Battle of Dunkirk leading up to the rescue, the evacuation. And it absolutely describes Jay Powell's Federal Reserve leading up to March 2020, especially the first half of March 2020 when things got all sorts of bad everywhere, including the treasury market that, that uh, experienced so much selling it couldn't absorb everything. And here's Jay trying to tell us the Fed did a good job. No, he was the one that let the system 
to disaster. I mean, we talked about this a number of times about quantitative, not QE uh, in, is from 2019 and 2020, buying up treasury bills, leaving the system short of collateral so that it, when it got to its moment of maximum pain, there was even fewer treasury bills available for the system to write itself. So, but, you know, Jay is trying to tell you, basically gaslight you into thinking that hey, March 2020 was the Fed's finest hour, to borrow another World War II phrase, when it was anything but. But see, under an expectations policy, he, he has to sell you on that idea so that you believe in everything else the Fed was, is doing currently so that the, that the recovery can continue on its way. At the end of that section where you uh, introduced that quote to us from uh, a reader, you say that this ain't over. But then you explained that you're not referring that you expect another March 2020 calamity. So what is not over yet, Jeff? What are we going to face? The aftermath, the effects, the lingering the problems, the continuous monetary drag that always, that always continues, that always keeps the, uh, ec the global economy from reaching its potential again. That's why we always see we have this, we have this event. It's a monetary event in nature. And then after the event, curiously, unlike any other time in post-war history, we don't get a recovery. It always falls short. And that leads into all these other things that we've been talking about, you know, central bank's inflation puzzle. Why can the central bank never hit its inflation target? Well, it all, it all leads into these things together. Once you have that monetary break, you can't come back from it. We can never get back from it. And so when I say this ain't over, that's what I mean that we've, we've, we've experienced the, the second monetary event of the last 20, 20 years or so. And now we expect that the economy will probably not perform as well as, as everybody seems to think, including Mr. Powell. And Jeff, you said we experienced the second ec economic event of the last 20 years. And I think, you, did you, I think you're referring to just the United States, because if you look worldwide, it's two or three. If you're in Europe, this is your third one. If you're in China, this is your... I don't know, I guess you could say it's the second one as well, but there have been four total, two worldwide and two uh, focused on Europe and one in China. Yeah, so, we bring up the, you know, if you talk about the second or the third of those, what we call Euro dollar two and Euro dollar number three, most people in America are like, what? What do you mm -hmm. mean? There was nothing, 2012, what was that? You know, 2011, 2015, I don't remember anything happening then. There was an oil supply glut, something like that, right? So from the people perspective of Americans, they really only understand Euro dollar four and Euro dollar number one. And you're right, in China, Euro dollar number three or Brazil, emerging markets, the third one was the worst one. Um, so it's, it's all of these, these hidden anomalies or at least what, they, what seem like anomalies that make it very difficult to put together a comprehensive story. And certainly it's not the one that Jay Powell is going to tell you when he keeps saying the Fed is this heroic actor saving the system time and time again, not already knowing that his audience is never going to question him about, wait a minute, why do you have to keep saving a system? You keep, you, we've, been, we've heard from since Ben Bernanke how everything is fine, the, the financial system is robust and resilient, and therefore you would think it wouldn't require that much effort to keep it from destroying itself. And Jeff, you have noticed some anomalies materializing recently. And you list them here, oil, the New Zealand dollar, the euro, the yuan, copper. Where, what else am I looking at here? You can help me. Uh, yeah, contango. The, Going back to the, you know, our oil discussion. There's contango a in the WTI curve. There's a date that they're all related to. They all keep pointing back at February 25th, 24th, 25th. That they're, those, those couple days keep coming up. And it's, it's, it's in a pretty wide variety of data and prices and markets, which you start to think, well, what, what happened on May 24th and 25th? And if you think back to the 25th specifically, oh yeah, that was the day the treasury market blew out. You know, the treasury market experienced a really severe bout of selling. You saw the five-year uh, US treasury, the yield spiked almost 20 basis points in a single day. It was a really bad day in the treasury, you know, bond route, bloodbath, massacre, however you want to put it. You know, the coming of the inflationary monster finally let, being let loose. At least that's how it's commonly described. Jeff, you know what I'm very proud of? On the 1st of March, we released our episode number 52, Anomalies or Triggers. 
And that one was recorded on the 26th. It was just in the air. You know, there were things that were breaking at that time. And one of them was Fedwire, which is the title of your piece here. Now, Jeff, when you're looking at your charts and you notice, okay, the 24th in oil, the 25th in the New Zealand dollar, and then you look back in your notes and you go, oh, there's copper the 24th. Do you get a cold sweat when you look back at your notes and you realize that the Fedwire disruption happened on the 24th, 25th? I mean, does that, I mean, do you, are you like, oh, this is unbelievable or no, that's just me. No, because it, it, <laughs> it's one of those things that, you know, you write down and say, okay, did this actually, as it happened, you don't know, was this a meaningful event or not? And in fact, that's what our discussion was on the, on the 26th when we talked about it in the podcast was, is this one of those things that we have to put it right down in pencil and come back to and say, this was an important thing? Or is this going to be like the like when it happened in 1990, a complete trivial non-event that we for easily forget about? So for me, it's on my it's on my note sheet right next to my computer where it says, hey, February 24th, Fedwire. And so for the last month, it's been like, you know, going back and check, okay, 24th, Fedwire, are we still seeing the same thing? So it wasn't, it wasn't much of a surprise, but you know, after a month, we're starting to see all of these things happen in, mark, in markets and the change in trend, at least a short run trend, all dates back to that. You start to, you start to really wonder, did we actually see something significant? And I think it's worthwhile going back and, and repeating what happened on the 24th, which was that the Fedwire system, which is a, a key component of the global dollar, global US dollar um, settling system, the way that banks and financial firms and markets and exchanges all settle up on these trillions of trades and in, in the uh, monetary transactions runs through a central Fedwire uh, access that for a couple hours that day on the 24th, just shut down completely, shut down entirely for reasons that have never been fully explained. And when that had happened in the past, it causes a cascading effect where especially the banking system has to, has to uh, work around what, what becomes almost like a bottleneck, a monetary bottleneck, a level of uncertainty because you, can't, you aren't assured that you can clear trades. You don't know how much money is gonna be pulled from your balance sheet or how much money you're gonna have left at, at the end of the day. And it can cause severe knock-on effects that, that really do alter behavior, alter mon uh, monetary type mechanics of these money dealers because they have to take into account well, I just got I just got hit with unexpected disruption that causes that can potentially cause something severe. And ladies and gentlemen, if you wanted to hear us discussing this in much greater detail, I recommend three episodes. Episode forty-seven, when we discuss a disruption to interbank netting communications in November of 1985. Then in episode fifty, we go back to the 1970s and discuss her stat, her stat risk. And what, how would you describe it? That, uh, again, just interbank netting messaging. That, yeah, the 1974, that, really severe, caused major, major problems in the global dollar system. And that was the one that you to, to really pay attention to. And then episode 52. So three episodes about disruption to interbank netting, daylight overdrafts. And then of course we talked about it in oh with Isabella Kaminska as well. What episode was that? 58. So that was in part three with her, if I remember correctly. Yes, I think so. So, wow, we've been talking about it a lot and it seems like it may be an important event in a few months when we look back, but we don't know yet, right, Jeff? So we seem to be, as we close out this episode, we seem to be at a point where the momentum has been meek and now it's, Things are popping up on the radar screen that are suggesting slowing even further in the momentum, inflection yeah. downward maybe. We still have February 24th and Fedwire written in pencil. We don't know for sure that it, it's a, you know, this is not necessarily the, you know, inflection point. But there, you know, one month later, one month is a significant length of time, though we're still in the short run. We're starting to see higher dollar exchange value. Again, yuan and euro going lower, which are pretty key indications. Uh, we're seeing interest rates around the world stop rising in some places to go lower, like New Zealand. 
were co coincident to the New Zealand dollar. Again, we talked about oil and contango, copper, all sorts of things that are at least at this point in the short term, pointing back to that Fedwire disruption, saying, "Okay, hold on a minute. Let's 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 see let's see what happens from here, because we don't really know if this is a longer term problem or longer term inflection." Uh, is the dollar system rolling over out of inflation into euro dollar number five, if it is actually in euro dollar number five? Are we seeing the beginning processes of the beginning stages of it? Because that's what really the Fed wire would, the Fed wire event would work into. It's not an event by itself. It's another accumulated problem that becomes one problem to many that causes the, the global banking system, which is the backbone of the monetary system, to tuck its tail between its leg, take risk off the table a little bit at a time, which causes this monetary constraint and eventually a, more, a growing more acute dollar shortage. So whether or not we're there, you can't say for sure. I mean, we can't tell right now, but there are enough, enough things happening, enough trends changing, enough curves bending, enough lines moving in different directions in a whole variety of places that we have our suspicions being raised. And again, they all go back to around February 24th, 25th, which has a specific, specific trigger that we've been talking about. So from this point forward, we got to pay attention to this and keep that February 24th Fedwire thing in mind to see if that's what really ends up happening. And we will be every week on YouTube, on the podcast and daily with your writings at Alhambra Investments. So thank you very much, Jeff. I enjoyed the show. I'll talk to you again next week. Okay, take care, Emil.